to the opinions of pop economists. They have their own views and they understand the fundamentals of the emerging markets. They also seem to take a very long-term view when in advising clients on BRICS matters and on you know, various economic transactions. And it has to be a win-win for it to work, and this is something which I feel is very unique to them. They are thoughtful, even under stress, under times of severe, severe pressure. They never have a knee-jerk reaction to an event. They understand that they are in it for the long run, and they are focused on solutions, not problems. You know, the typical response of, 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 of a lawyer would be just to read out a whole list of problems. Uh, but they seem to be innovative. They seem to talk until the clients really understand the problems in 3D, and they provide solutions. And, and that's what I mean when I, when, when I say that they are accountable as lawyers. They invest time in the clients, and they really look for innovation and, and collaboration. The advice creates wealth. Uh, they protect their clients' wealth and they help their, their clients to, to transact across borders, but they create wealth beyond the numbers. And, and what I mean by that is that they naturally resolve conflict, they naturally build respect in the way that they deal with other members of the BRICS community. And I think that this is very important. It's not the traditional situation where you're just looking after your clients' rights, protecting your client. Uh, uh, and being aggressive toward the other party, they really see that it's important to build bridges, even when there is a conflict situation. And this is very unique to the, the BRICS lawyers that I've dealt with. Um, I've dealt with many lawyers across, uh, across uh, different continents, including the London uh, set of lawyers. But this, to me, is a very unique BRICS uh, dynamic which I'm picking up in my, in my practice. So that was the, the emerging BRICS professional as lawyers. But as I've been implying, they are leaders as well. And when I say that they are leaders, I mean they are thought leaders. They shape opinion. They are independent thinkers who excite others about BRICS. They have a passion for teaching or coaching. And because they, they have this passion, they are naturally good at it. Because passion is the genesis of excellence. Most importantly, though, they seem to build the BRICS narrative. They are good storytellers, and they seem to naturally tell a, a narrative which would sustain the clients as well as the other attorneys in, in the BRICS story. They are planners, they are scholars. What I mean by this is that in every transaction which has been designed, uh, that I've been involved in, Due regard is given to the rule of law. So when they, when they implement a deal, when they are, are conducting even research, regard is always had to the, the rule of law, and they attempt to resolve conflicts before they happen. And they do lots of scenario planning, uh, which I found is quite unique. So in a sense, they do time travel. They look at previous uh, litigation or previous uh, commercial transactions, and then they look at a future state. And, and they look at which is the best route to follow. Things like the, the one road, one belt, Silk Road, for example, is something which is very important when, when planning logistics and value chains for a retailer like myself. And my favorite slide is this slide over here. Being a proud father of a, a boy and a girl, uh, you know, I believe that this is something unique to the BRICS lawyers. They seem to be working hard for the next generation. They are building a legacy. Uh, and it's a situation where they make sure that there is succession in their legal practice, in their relationships, and they ensure relational continuity. And I think this is very unique to, to the BRICS attorneys which I've worked with. They understand corporate governance. Uh, I advise various boards on corporate governance, and it's not just a, a mere buzzword. You know, you, you can always tell when you deal with, with other um, attorneys and with, with, with various uh, uh, business people whether they truly understand governance. And I think this is something which is uh, almost inherent to the, to the BRICS legal community. It's honesty, it's integrity, it's not just the, the flavor of the month. They are, they are critical uh, of other uh, companies uh, within the BRICS nations when their corporate governance is not up to scratch. So they are critical. But again, they do tend to be constructive in, in their critiques. 
Also, they, they tend to sit on many corporate boards as a way to ensure that their clients have, are good corporate citizens. And I, I would encourage this uh, because, it, in a way, it's a sense of, uh, in a way, it is a, a, a way of controlling your client in a positive way to make sure that they implement best practice as regards corporate governance. They are powerful networkers and they share their contacts. What I mean by this is that they ensure that there is relational proximity across the BRICS nations. They ensure that there is relational proximity and they make sure they build powerful, meaningful networks over time. Um, and I think this is something worth noting. And they are not afraid to acknowledge the role that others have played in their success. They understand the human factor. They celebrate others. They acknowledge others who have helped them. So in a sense, after a deal or even a, the, a successful research paper, they always close the circle by a celebration of sorts. Um, in South Africa, we have the term Ubuntu, which is essentially filtering through in this concept of thanking others and, and understanding that others are a part of your success. Their relational networks seem to act as early warning systems, and they are able to detect anything which could be devil, an important deal or a transaction. And in a sense, they are problem hunters. So the, the, the two transactions which I've dealt with in the past two years uh, were potentially scuppered uh, through various uh, miscommunications. But it seems that with these BRICS lawyers, they often resolve uh, issues through this early warning system, especially as regards governments or regulatory authorities. And they take quick action, uh, action like legal diplomacy when these problems arise. Um, they take a quick appro appropriate action. And this, this is what makes them leaders. So we've looked at the emerging BRICS legal professional as an excellent lawyer, as a leader. But in my view, they are also lions. You know, the misconception about the African lion is that he's a lazy uh, um, alpha male, you know, resting in the shade under a tree. But nocturnally, they are very active. They patrol, they look out for their pride. In a sense, they are looking for opportunities and looking to protect their pride from problems. So, in a sense, that is what I've experienced with many of these BRICS legal professionals. They, they, are, they know that much depends upon them, um, and they know that there's a lot of responsibility on, on them to make this narrative of BRICS actually work, actually take effect. And I've noticed that, as I say, they carry responsibility well, and they are very active. They attend conferences, they, they network. Um, in many, sense, many senses, they are aligned in that way. They are resilient. So they understand how to wait out a storm, uh, they know that storms do pass, and they are committed to seeing deals through, especially in, in the context of BRICS. Um, and I can't stress enough that it takes, a, in a sense, a, a large amount of aggression to hang in there, to stay in a deal, to stay in a relationship for your client. And this is something which I've noticed about the BRICS attorneys and certain academics I've worked with over the past two years. They are not loners, um, as you can see by that image. They understand the power of the pride. They understand that it is important to work as a team and that you get more done like that. They are authentic, and because they are part of a team, they have nothing to prove and nothing to hide. And most importantly, they enjoy being unique. They enjoy being affiliated to something as unique as, unique as the BRICS Alliance. Um, they enjoy being who they are, and they take pleasure in being BRICS legal professionals. Thank you very much for your time. Craig, thank you so much. It's so nice to be equated to the African lion. Uh, I think this this is a true nationalism of Africa, but at least I personally think it's one of the best descriptions, and I think we will use this um, together for the BRICS lawyer, the African lion. Um, and if any other countries have any other suggestions, we can add on to the list. 
Uh, that includes Russia. I don't know if Russia comes up. Bear, okay. Uh, lion sounds a little more impressive. So uh, we'll, we'll figure out the bear and the... Um, Sham, what do you say for India? <laughs> we, we have a li tiger, yes. I, I think so we can go with these kind of descriptions to possibly incorporate that as part of our um, discourse. And just to tell you, in India, one third of the cabinet, one third of the cabinet is lawyers. Um, so there's a large presence and national leaders have been lawyers involved in the freedom struggle and thereafter. And now you will find one of the largest contingent in the BRICS lawyers. Um, I also have uh, a duty to perform at my level, aside from being the chairing the session. Um, and I would be speaking on um, finding a balance between right to life and IPR, intellectual property rights. Um, I think it's one of the very key concerns for emerging economies, in particular, uh, whether we talk about Brazil, we talk about India, China, the right to access, the right to access to cheap, inexpensive, affordable medicines, and particularly life-saving medicines. Uh, I think that is the discourse around which we need to consider and target, um, ultimately because we have this is one of the areas where BRICS can go forward for the reason that you have a different concept which prevails between developed countries which believe in patenting of medicines irrespective of the cost it has on human life uh, as a contrast to developing and emerging economies which have more stakes uh, in the life and uh, liberty of, of their citizens um, and their residents and their people to ensure that they have a right to healthy life and a right to access um, and India, in fact, has done a, a fair job on uh, this, which I will come to a little later. Um, we all know that in, in, by the TRIPS, what has been introduced is a product patent. And the product patent essentially means that you have a monopoly for 20 years on the product itself, which means you eliminate competition. You don't have people coming up, so you don't have development of uh, other uh, manufacturers. You don't have development of other people in the market, you don't have other competition in terms of pricing. You have exorbitant pricing with a product patent because ultimately there's a monopoly in the product. Um, the, you reduce accessibility to medicines and particularly to life-saving medicines. The general myth around the subject is that the reason you must have a product patent, which has been developed over the course of generations, is that you must have patent and you must protect it because uh, otherwise, Research is reduced. People put in money in R&D, research and development, and they will only put it in if they have a stake in the product that is produced and they have a patent in the right that is produced. Whether that is to be so or not, I think that is the basic area of concern. And if it is to be so, what are the exceptions to that? What are the safeguards that we need to develop in the context of human rights is, is the issue which we are looking at. Um, research drugs, incidentally, while talking about this myth that has been created, um, in the developed countries and the, the Western worlds. Uh, the research drugs, it is said you won't invest much money, but what one has found on examination is that there is little relevance in the research to the health mode as far as that is concerned. Most of it is to do with profiteering and to make money. Um, you also have a question of research is concentrating principally not on life-saving diseases, but on lifestyle diseases. So whether you have, I'm sorry, Alexis, but the baldness um, or obesity, uh, these are the kind of issues which seem to be more concerned with the research and the money spent on the research than on actual life-saving drugs. I'm not saying there is none. I'm simply making a contrast to see where the, where the concentration uh, could lie. Uh, India, in compliance of PRIPS, also brought in product patent um, in 1999 and uh, 2002. And that has become the subject matter of uh, 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 amazing amount of discourse um, as far as the issue is concerned, to what extent we can go. Um, I found something very interesting which Thomas Jefferson said, interestingly, um, even though uh, America turns out to be one of the greatest uh, <laughs> uh, violators of, of these rights, but look at what Thomas Jefferson says. If nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea. No one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. This is the typical argument of jurisprudence that everybody has rights and if everybody exercises equal rights, then nobody's rights can actually be exercised. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening 
mine as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me in jefferson's vision there are no barriers to the acquisition of knowledge nobody owns it everybody partakes of it and the world becomes richer uh, alas as we said his country is the most venal violator of this value and patenting is one of the most uh, greatest features in in us as we all know our cultural cornerstone the rigveda that is india uh, mandates let noble thoughts come to us from every side patenting intellect or its products is sacrilegious and a social outrage so we are talking about ideas and unless there is some inventive process whether there is any purpose to be achieved particularly when human health is involved is a question the role of courts the role of courts uh, in developing countries in the pro health rights scenario um, there are five reasons why it is important for courts in developing countries not to ignore or to take into account the right to health when adjudicating pharmaceutical patent cases uh for one the courts have to be more vigilant when scrutinizing legislation aimed at granting stronger protection to patents we might be compelled at times to have legislation whether because of international obligations or otherwise but the attempts of courts has to be to view it in the perspective of human rights and i think that is where the brics countries and the courts within brics countries can play a very important role one of the aberrations if i may say so has been the kenyan anti counterfeit act Uh, one of the examples of the current expansionist trends in international patent law which seeks to use border and customs control measures to prevent the movement of counterfeit goods across international borders while such measures might actually be helpful in protecting pe- people from harmful fake products such measures can equally restrict access to low cost generic medicines so whether the anti counterfeit act could be used differently could be modified could be considered by the courts to have the aspect of right to health is one such example in question secondly as far as the courts are concerned and the interpretation is concerned incorporating a right to health perspective into pharmaceutical patent cases enables a court to properly construe and apply the flexibility uh, flexibilities which are contained in the domestic patent law such as provisions for compulsory licensing and parallel importation i think that is a very important feature which by and large is where the the game is today we have flexibilities the doha declaration incorporated flexibilities and for, for domestic countries um, countries to look at the domestic laws so that it is interpreted keeping in mind the interest of the country concerned um to what extent it should be applied again politically there is one possibility but courts have a very large horizon in this and if we can construe the flexibilities in the context of a particular countries more widely i think we can achieve a, a particular target uh, an example in question has been the oching case in the kenyan high court incorporated a right to health perspective into decision and properly construed the provision on parallel importation so flexibility parallel importation in the specific context of importation of generic drugs is something the kenyan high court noted until the passage of the industrial property act in 2001 it was not possible for poor people infected with hiv um, and aids to access anti retroviral medication as the only ones available were expensive branded medicines generic anti retroviral drugs were not available in kenya as the existing legislation did not allow parallel importation of generic drugs and medicines section 58 of the act allowed the parallel importation of generic drugs it is on the basis of this legislation that availability and access to anti retroviral drugs has increased and greatly enhanced the life and health of persons such as the petitioners who have been living with hiv hiv and aids the incorporation of a right to health perspective can therefore also assist a court in construing patent laws and flexibilities in a manner that serves a fundamental and critical need of securing access to medicines Uh, in the indian case for example the delhi high court refused to grant an injunction sought by roche against sipla for the latter's production of the former's patented drug the delhi high court noted the court cannot be unmindful of the right of the general public to access life saving drugs which are available and for which such access would be denied if the injunction were granted so the test was the right and the access and the right of the general public to access life saving drugs the degree of harm the delhi high court said in such eventuality is absolute the chances of improvement of life expectancy even chances of recovery in some cases would be snuffed out altogether if injunction were granted another way of viewing this is that if the injunction in the case of a life saving drug were to be granted the court 
would in effect be stifling Article 21 of the Constitution, which provides for the right to life. Article 21, ladies and gentlemen, um, safeguards the right to life in the Indian context. And coming back to the quotation, and which forms the bedrock of the right to health in India, so far as those who would have or could have access to erlotisip are concerned, which is a medicine. Thirdly, the courts in developed countries and developing countries sorry, should equally be aware that courtrooms are now forums for shaping and reshaping global health diplomacy. While multinational pharmaceutical companies can successfully lobby for stronger patent protection in international trade forums, poor patients and civil society groups usually rely on domestic courts, that is the courts of the countries concerned, to ensure that their interests are protected at the local level. Consequently, in a situation where more courts in developing countries are adopting a right to health perspective in pharmaceutical patent cases, it will encourage litigants in other developing countries to seek the assistance of local courts. And the, then the entire movement goes on. Fourthly, as the impact of non-communicable diseases such as cancer continues to increase in developing countries, it is obvious that more patients will require access to expensive but essential drugs in order to sustain a healthy lifestyle. A right to health perspective will therefore ensure that the courts are mindful of the importance of the availability of cheaper generic drugs in the market. Uh, the Kenyan High Court in the Oching case, which I mentioned earlier, was mindful of the need to ensure that generic anti antiroviral drugs remained affordable and accessible. Finally, the court's perspective again, the fifth point. It is important to note that unlike the situation in industrialized countries, where there are sophisticated mechanisms, you have antitrust laws, you have anti-competition laws that can be used to curb the excesses of pharmaceutical companies in several developing countries. The legal framework to curb anti-competitive activities is either undeveloped, underutilized, or non-existent. So we need to actually see that the courts can do this exercise, which possibly is missing in policy and in, in the domestic law. Um, I'll just refer briefly to one of the cases in India, which I think highlights the entire significance of how flexibilities uh, within the framework of even TRIPS can be utilized to safeguard the right of health. In early April this year, India's Supreme Court rejected an application by the Swiss multinational pharmaceutical company Novartis for a patent on a modified version of the leukemia, which is cancer, medication imatinib mesylate. Naturally, the outcome of the case affects the affordability of the drug. But the core issue was the right of the Indian government to take account of public health in designing intellectual property rights. In India, Novartis charges about US dollars 26,000 per patent per year for the drug which is marketed as Glivec, uh, Glivec in the United States. But generic versions produced by local companies were available for less than US dollars 2,500. So the difference is almost phenomenally high. Novartis' price excludes all patients ex except the extremely rich, although the company supplies Glivec for free to some patients. The Indian government and civil society groups see the situation as health policy being held hostage to corporate charity, and to us it is unacceptable. The Novartis case confirms that the right of India's parliament to implement public health safeguards available under TRIPS which might otherwise be a little firm against the interest of health, but nonetheless provides for flexibilities. Um, we could utilize that. Uh, the flexibilities mostly revolve around the conditions for market entry or alternative generic brands. The term generic brands uh, drugs refers to a copy of an original patent product whose patent has expired. In India, all drugs were generic before 2005 because there were no product patents. Um, Novartis looked legal action against the Indian government to challenge the constitutionality of what is Section 3D in the Patents Act. When this was rejected, the company sought Novartis to have imatinib mesylate recognized as patentable, but it did not even purport to demonstrate enhanced efficacy as required under the law. Uh, Novartis aimed to put a stop to generic competition. It was also attempting to prevent the export of locally produced more affordable brands to other developed countries. In the judgment, the court determined that imatinib mesylate is not patentable as it fails the test of Section 3D. And while rejecting this, this challenge, the court ruled that a minor modification to an existing pharmaceutical substance does not merit a 20-year patent monopoly. After all, patents were premised on the notion that an invention had to demonstrate some cognitive leap over and above what existed before, and not comprise mere trial and error. Supreme Court's refusal to protect global investments through patent monopolies, that's the Indian Supreme Court, though grounded in the text of the law, 
also appears to stem from a national interest perspective, taking into account concerns of both public interest, where India contains a significant number of poor patients with no health coverage, and private interest, where India is home to some of the leading generic companies that might lose their competitive advantage with a rather liberal uh, patent regime. Um, I might say that with this, I would like to conclude to say that the right to life, which includes the right to health, is one of the most important um, fundamental rights that any of the BRICS countries need to look at. We have to look at international perspective, but we, the BRICS countries, can utilize our legal systems to interpret it in such a manner that it is more beneficial for the right of access, for the right of affordability, for the right of uh, drugs, for the right. Uh, the patents may remain for the time being in some fashion, but the flexibilities in the parallel importation are two such concepts which the courts can consider. And the third feature that the courts can consider and must consider is other international obligations obligations and national obligations, which include human rights as one of the most fundamentally important rights that has to inhere to every citizen. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I now continue with my, with my other role, um, the African line or what is <laughs> the Liu, um, now we have Liu uh, Zemam, uh, CHN, who is a professor of North China University uh, of Technology. Um, the topic that he is dealing with is the legal construction of local government in China. Welcome. The law status of local government in China. Because of time limited, now I want to give my speech in Chinese. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Today, 是中国基层政府法治状况在城市管理执法方面法治状况的这样一个基本定位这个国家层面的制度设计和基层政府法治的这样一个基本定位呃一九九九年呢全中国的全国人大就在他的宪法修正案中就确定了依法治国的宏伟方列在之后的零四年中国的国务院提出了全面推进依法行政纲要这可以
。那么，在二零一五年十二月二十八号，国家公布了《法治政府的建设实施纲要》，进一步清晰地界定了法治政府的内涵。这个内涵呢，在这里可以表述为：职能科学、权责法定、执法严明、公正、公开公正、廉洁高效、守法诚信。那么，这样的一个在中央层面的治国方略，在基层政府的推进过程之中，呈现出怎样的一种状况呢？这个就涉及到。我和我的研究团队在学术研究方法上的一个选择。总体来说，从实践过程层面上，推进依法行政，建设建设法